Salute 2 and Proton K. Salyut was the name given to the Soviet Union's program that sought to create the first ever space station. Running from 1971 to 1986, the Salyut program was ultimately responsible for the world's first crewed space station, despite several explosive failures along the way. Among the many launches made as part of the Salyut program was that of the ill-fated Salyut 2, a highly secretive Almaz military space station in 1973. The Almaz program, which ran parallel to the public Salyut program, sought to place military reconnaissance stations into orbit, disguising them as civilian Salyut stations so as not to draw attention. The Soviets envisioned Salyut 2 as the first of many such stations, but it was not to be a successful start. The mission's catastrophic failure can be traced to the Proton K rocket used to launch Salyut 2 and most other Soviet spacecraft at the time. The Proton K was one of the Soviet space program's flagship launch assets, measuring 160 feet long and capable of delivering immensely large payloads as heavy as 50,000 pounds into orbit. Launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome on April 3, 1973, the Salyut 2 station successfully entered low Earth orbit. However, the final stage of the three-stage Proton K rocket, responsible for launching Salyut 2, also entered orbit near the station rather than returning to Earth as planned. Not designed to withstand the lack of atmosphere in orbit, this third stage section began to experience unanticipated changes in tank pressure. Three days after launch, the third stage exploded, creating a deadly cloud of debris racing around the globe on the same trajectory as the station itself. Ten days later, this cloud reached the station with a hail of debris shredding the hull and tearing off its all-important solar panels. Less than two weeks after launch, while still unmanned, Salyut 2 began to depressurize and lose altitude. On May 18, 1973, it re-entered Earth's atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean, decaying as it fell. American estimates put the cost of a Salyut craft at around $500 million, and that of a Proton K rocket, which were also used to launch the Soviet moon probes and other spacecraft, at between $60 and $70 million in 1973. The total cost was equivalent to almost $4 billion today, making it one of the most expensive rocket failures of all time. The Almaz program would continue through the 1970s, but after three failed launches, the Soviet Ministry of Defense deemed it too costly in terms of time and resources and shut it down. Starship In April 2023, Elon Musk's SpaceX attempted to launch Starship, the largest and most powerful rocket ever built, from the Starbase launch site in Boca Chica, Texas. This site had been chosen for its southerly location and proximity to the equator, which allowed the Earth's rotational speed to assist in orbital launches. Starship had two stages, the first being the 230-foot-tall Super Heavy rocket booster, comprising 33 of SpaceX's methane-fueled Raptor engines that could produce a combined 17.1 million pounds of thrust. The second stage was a 160-foot-tall spacecraft fitted with six additional Raptor engines designed to operate in the vacuum of outer space. The combined stack stood at 394 feet tall. The April 20th test flight was expected to last 90 minutes, with the second stage planned to splash down near Hawaii following a brief period in space. As the Starship's ascent began, at least six of the Super Heavy's 33 Raptor engines shut down without warning. Additionally, the second stage failed to detach from the booster. Just minutes after liftoff, the rocket began to spin and veer off course before exploding into a vast fireball above the Gulf of Mexico. SpaceX quickly announced that its flight termination system, a self-destruct sequence designed to ensure that the rocket cannot veer off course and cause damage, was initiated, destroying both stages of the rocket. Despite the explosion, SpaceX claims the launch was a success as the rocket passed several key objectives, including clearance of the launch tower, achievement of supersonic speeds, and survival beyond the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure, otherwise known as Max-Q. 
According to data from the SpaceX launch feed, the rocket reached a maximum altitude of 24 miles and a top speed of 1,340 miles per hour. SpaceX released the following statement. With a test like this, success comes from what we learn, and we learn a tremendous amount. The exact reason for the rocket's explosive end is still under investigation. However, some observers point to the damaged launch pad as a possible cause. Starbase's orbital launch mount was not built with a flame trench to deflect plume exhaust away from the pad during liftoff, despite this being a standard feature for similar powerful rockets. The sheer power of the launch kicked up a cloud of debris and large chunks of concrete that caused damage to the surrounding equipment at the launch base, and may have damaged the rocket itself. And one. One of the earliest Soviet super-heavy liftoff rockets designed to place spacecraft into orbit was the N-1. As the Soviet equivalent of the American Saturn V rocket, the N-1 was intended to facilitate the delivery of the first human crew to the moon. Until the 2023 SpaceX Starship launch, the first stage of the N-1 made it the most powerful rocket ever flown. This immense power, however, was difficult to control. Four attempts were made to launch N-1s in the late 1960s and early 70s. Each of them failed, largely for reasons which could have been prevented if proper tests had been carried out in the earlier stages of development. Whereas the Saturn V had just five massive engines, the N-1 had 30, 24 of which were dedicated to providing thrust for the first stage of the launch sequence. It has since been argued that the N-1 may have been overpowered, and that this, combined with poor craftsmanship, is to blame for its failures. The second of the N-1's launches was particularly devastating, and it occurred on July 3, 1969, at 11.18 p.m. Moscow time. Shortly after leaving the launch pad, the rocket slowed and began to plummet. A single bolt had come loose, enabling oxygen to be drawn into one of the 30 engines' fuel pumps. Following this, all but one of the engines shut off. The rocket tilted, and the N-1 fell back to the pad. A domino effect of explosions ensued, with the chain reaction of immense power shattering windows and launching debris over six miles. The resulting explosion, which entirely destroyed the launch pad 110 East, was equivalent in force to a small nuclear bomb and constituted one of the largest man-made non-nuclear explosions in history. Two more N-1 launches would be attempted before the program was shut down and neither would be successful. This failure marked the end of the USSR's mission to put a man on the moon. Nadalin Catastrophe Some of the most catastrophic rocket failures in history have involved those with a military purpose. One such example of this is what became known as the Nadalin Catastrophe. On October 24, 1960, at the military-controlled launch pad and Baikonur Cosmodrome facility in Soviet Kazakhstan, officials prepared a test flight of the R-16 intercontinental ballistic missile. Weighing more than 140 tons and measuring between 100 and 112 feet in length, depending on the equipped warhead, the R-16 would later become the first Soviet missile capable of carrying a thermonuclear payload as far as 8,000 miles, making it a substantial international threat. At the Baikonur Cosmodrome, the R-16 appeared ready for its test flight when the second stage engine exploded in a massive fireball. It was later determined that a short circuit had caused the second stage engine to ignite. The Soviet government covered up the number of victims and the nature of the accident for many years. It's now believed to have claimed the lives of more than 78 people, primarily military personnel and technical engineers, although some estimates say the death toll may be as high as 300. The catastrophe was not even acknowledged by the Soviets until 1989. Another contributing factor may have been the fact that Nadalin, the head of the program, was pushing for a test flight before the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, and this put immense pressure on the engineers who were left with little time to prepare, forcing them to cut corners regarding safety protocols. Nadalin, after whom the catastrophe was named, was killed in the explosion. 
Exactly three years to the day after the R-16 incident, another explosion occurred at the same location, this time originating from an R-9 missile and again causing multiple fatalities. Since these two incidents, October 24th has been referred to as Baikonur's Black Day. Pepcon Disaster Pepcon, the Pacific Engineering and Production Company of Nevada, was responsible for producing vast quantities of chemicals used to manufacture solid rocket fuels. In the late 1980s, the plant, situated just 10 miles from Las Vegas, produced the ammonium perchlorate used in many types of launches requiring massive thrust, including NASA's space shuttle and military weapons. On May 4, 1988, sometime between 11.30 and 11.40 a.m., a small fire broke out at the plant, the result of some employees repairing a wind-damaged fiberglass structure. This fire, exacerbated and accelerated by ammonium perchlorate residue, quickly spread. Despite firefighting attempts, the flames soon spread to a number of 55-gallon drums which contained the volatile substance. A combination of flammable fiberglass buildings and a fast northeasterly wind allowed the fire to engulf the entire facility. Employees scattered and fled on foot and in cars as a series of seven explosions began. The two largest explosions measured 3.0 and 3.5 on the Richter scale. The final detonation created a crater 15 feet deep and 200 feet wide. It was estimated to be as large as a one kiloton nuclear bomb, making it the largest civilian explosion in the history of the United States. While most employees managed to escape the inferno with their lives, two were killed and almost 400 were injured. Kara McGee, the only other U.S. producer of the same chemicals, was technically located in the blast zone, just 1.5 miles from the Pepcon facility. Mercifully, however, the Kara McGee facility suffered only minor damage and no explosions. Was the explosion of SpaceX's Starship actually a success, as the company claims? Let me know what you think in the comments below, and thank you for watching Dark 5. Like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond.